Well, amen, you may have a seat. Again, good morning and, and happy new year, 2017. Man, that sounds weird. Well, I, it's a time of resolutions and goals, and so I have a goal for you guys this morning. My goal is to deliver the best sermon you've heard all year so far. <laughs> so I think, I think I can reach my goal. Um, but seriously, it's, it's good to be with you guys here this morning. If, if you don't know me, my name is Matt Shively, and, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Grove. And I uh, do junior high ministry and, and a number of other things. But I'm glad to be here with you guys. We're starting a new series to start a new year. We're going to talk through some of the principles of this book that's called The uh, Catalyst Leader, Eight Essentials for Becoming a Changemaker. And the author, Brad Lomanek, is going to be here towards the end of the series. Um, you can pick that up in the coffee shop if, if you'd like to track along with us. Uh, but this morning we are going to talk about this idea of, of calling. And as, as a believer, as a, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, we all have a general calling that we have uh, shared. We have this calling to live out God's word, to apply it to our lives, to become uh, better disciples of him, and then to uh, make other disciples of him. That's our general calling. But we each also have a specific calling that God has wired into each of us. And so today we're going to talk about that idea of calling what that means and, and how we can, uh, we can come to answer that call in our own lives. As we're, we're uh, talking through this morning, I want to just put one question in your mind to think about. Um, what is it that, that perhaps God puts you on this earth to do? What's the one thing that God has wired in you to, to do with your life? And just think of that as we go through. But I wanted to start this morning by kind of telling my story of how God called me to be a pastor. And as a, as a kid, as, as many kids have this daunting question that someone poses to them at some point in their life, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and my first early answers to that question were, I want to be a baseball player. I want to be an astronaut. I want to, you know, these things that were very awesome. Um, but they were just kind of just the first thing that popped into my mind. But as I started to really think about that question, I realized that the same answer kept coming up. I kept saying I wanted to be a pastor. And in fifth grade Sunday school, uh, our teacher asked us that question and, and, and asked us, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I remember thinking about it, and all of a sudden I just said, hey, I want to be a pastor. And the teacher kind of nodded, and the kids kind of like, that sounds like the right answer. And, and honestly, I just thought I answered correctly, and I went on with life, and I forgot about it for years. I forgot about this, this idea that, that God wants me to be a pastor. When you fast forward to my first year of, of college, uh, I went off to college at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, in Lincoln Nebraska, and I had this idea uh, I was going to be a sports broadcaster. I was going to be the play-by-play -play voice on uh, baseball games and things like that. That's what I wanted to be. I forgot about the pastor thing for a while until uh, November of my freshman year there, I had this desire to, to really grow closer to God, and I realized that being off on my own, um, no one's making me go to church anymore, and my relationship with God had kind of struggled. And so I decided to commit an entire month to God. I was going to read my Bible every day. I was going to pray every day. I was going to journal and, and write stuff down and write prayers down, and, and I did it for 31 straight days. And somewhere in that time, I was sitting in the student union at the University of Nebraska in front of a warm fireplace, and I'm, I'm writing in my journal. And all of a sudden, I see this homeless guy just kind of walk in one door and out a second door. And after a while, I was kind of following him with my eyes, and he was just pacing around the entire union and, and just making laps of this place. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. And then as I'm praying, I felt God telling me, go talk to him. And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't want to. I mean, stranger danger, like I'm not doing that. And, and I, I was praying, and it just kept, kept coming back. No, you need to go talk to him, and you need to simply tell him. I love him. And I'm like, all right, all right, God, if that's, that's what you want me to do. I stood up, and I got super nervous all of a sudden, and, and I started pacing around the entire student union. And before I knew it, I was stalking a homeless guy. Like, <laughs> this escalated quickly. And so I was losing, quickly losing my nerve, and I, I looked up, and I saw my roommate, and he was eating at the food court, and I went and sat down next to him, and I said, hey, I need you to pray for me. And he prayed for me, and it was, it was all the strength that I needed to get up and and I went, and, and the, the homeless guy was sitting down, and I sat right next to him, kind of awkwardly turned and looked at him, and I said, hi, my name's Matt, and he said, my name's Brian. I said, hey, Brian, um, I want you to know that Jesus loves you, and he kind of smiled at me and said, thanks, 
<laughs> and I got up, I'm like, well, see you later. I mean, what else? I, I did what I was supposed to do. And I, I like floated back to my dorm. I was so excited because I, I, I simply obeyed God. I mean, I didn't change the man's life. But I sat and I acknowledged him. And I, made, most importantly, I obeyed what God was calling me to do. All of a sudden that, hey, I want you to be a pastor, kind of rushed back into my mind. I hadn't thought about it for years. And so later that night, I was in a small group with um, some people I, I, was, I went to small group with at, at, our, at our college, and I told that story of, of talking to this guy, and, and one of the girls in our small group came up to me and said, hey, you want to feed the homeless with me tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, and so the very next day, we're, we're walking up to this house that was converted into a soup kitchen in this neighborhood, and, and, we're, and I realized I had no idea what I was doing, and I turned to her, I said, hey, um... Do I need some kind of training? Like, what are we doing here? And she said, oh, you misunderstood me. We're not going to feed the homeless. I'm like, we're not. What are we going to do? We're going to eat with them. I'm like, oh, okay. So we walk in, and we got in line like every other homeless person, and we got a plate of food, and we sat, and I just remember sitting there and listening and talking, but mainly listening uh, to these, these homeless guys. And, and it was amazing just just to have a chance to acknowledge them and listen to them. No one listens to them. And um, it was amazing. That night, it was clear. I'm supposed to be a pastor. It, it, I didn't know if homeless pastor was a thing. I wasn't really sure. And so I started praying about it, and, and I transferred to a Bible college, and God made it clear it's, it's, it's youth ministry. It's being a junior high pastor. And so I started to study that, and I went to college for that. But God, it's amazing what answering that call and, and trying to truly listen and press in and, and obey him, how that shaped my life. Our key idea today is this. Living out your God-given call involves three steps. It involves discovering what that call is, choosing to embrace that call, and then to boldly take steps towards that call. And that's what we're going to do. Um, that's where, where we're going to go this morning. Uh, I wanna, our main text today will be in 1 Samuel chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and, and open up that. We're, we're going to read the first 10 verses of that chapter. But before we do that, I want to kind of set the tone and set the context for this. Samuel's call is what we're going to talk about today. But Samuel's call actually began long before Samuel was even born with his mom, Hannah. Hannah desperately wanted to be a mom. It was the deepest desire of her heart. And she was unable to be a mom. She was barren. And so she prayed and she prayed and she prayed for a son. And she fervently went to the temple and just poured herself into this, this prayer and this request to God. And she prayed so hard and so fervently that the priest Eli thought she was drunk or there's something wrong with her. Because she was mumbling to herself and, and, and finally asked her, hey, what's going on? And, and she told him, I, I want a son. And and. Her, her prayer went deeper than that. She said if, if God gave her a son, she would give that son back to him in service, that he would serve the Lord with his life. You see, Hannah was anointing this unborn child for, for God's work long before he was even born. And sure enough, she was pregnant and Samuel was born. And by the time he could be away from his mom, he, he went to the temple and he lived there and was raised by the priest Eli. Now, Israel at this time was um, not in the best place with God. They were, they were distant from him. They um, were not being sincere in their worship. In fact, that stemmed from Eli and the priestly line. His two sons would, would take the sacrifices that were meant for the Lord and they would, they would take it for themselves. And they, they defiled the Lord's um, sacrifice system. And they were far from God. And so at this time, Israel um, didn't really hear the word of the Lord very often because they weren't listening. And so that's the context in which this uh, passage takes place. So let's dive into this in 1 Samuel chapter 3, uh, verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli, and he said, here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went, and he lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. 
My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time. And Samuel got up and he went to Eli and he said, here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that it was the Lord calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and he lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears, hears of it tingle. I honestly wanted to end there just because it's such an epic way to end. Uh, tingle, that's, that's cool. So anyway, um, Samuel had a literal calling from God, didn't he? God was actually calling his name. But he also had this call on his life that was very specific. He was called to be a prophet. And the work of a prophet was not, uh, was not an easy job. It was not popular by any stretch of the imagination. But Samuel's call was to deliver hard truth to the people of Israel, especially at a time where they weren't listening to God at all. And so his very first message happened right after this passage ends. He had to go and tell Eli that basically the house of Eli, because of its corruption, would have consequences, would be judged by God. And then later, Samuel would be the guy to anoint the the first kings of Israel. But he was also the guy that had to come to King Saul and let him know that God's spirit had left his kingdom because he was disobedient. You see, Samuel's call was not necessarily easy, but it was what God had called and placed him on this planet to do. Today, we're going to look at three steps of how to live out our callings and, and that specific call that God has on your life. The first step is to discover your calling. In order to discover your calling, the first thing you have to do is you have to know the one who's calling you. You can't discover your calling if you don't know the one calling. Back in our passage, it made this little footnote to, to let us know that Samuel didn't know God's voice yet. He, he hadn't been revealed to him yet. And so his relationship with God wasn't there yet. He was a young boy. But in order to really figure out our calling in life and live it out, we need to know God. And so if you've not yet made a resolution for 2017, let me put in a good word for growing closer to God this year. Grow closer to him. Read your Bible, but don't just read it to check a box. Study it. Know it. Apply it to your life. Um, we, we've talked about this in the past, but if you, if you want somewhere to start, reading the book of Proverbs works really well because it fits in nicely because there's exactly 31 uh, chapters. And so this is January 1. If you want to start fresh, that gives you something, somewhere to start. Um, One of my desires is, as I continue to grow, is to grow in knowledge and depth of insight, and that starts with knowing God. And so for me, um, the Bible talks about hiding God's word in my heart, and what I think that means is is knowing it and, and inviting God into every decision we make, praying through decisions, praying through passages we read in the Bible as we study it, and making that a part of our life. So after we know the one who's calling us, then we have to know us. We have to know ourselves. And there's two kind of tiers to this. The first is, what, what are your spiritual gifts? What has God uh, gifted you with? There's uh, uh, several lists and examples of these in the, in the New Testament. And there's also lots of different tests you can take to, to start to uncover what your spiritual gifts are. But once you understand that, that, that unlocks kind of a new level of understanding God and how he's wired you. The second piece to that is, what are your passions? What do you love to do? Uh, and, and is there any way that passion can connect in with, with living out your life for God? I think that that is exactly where calling exists, is where these two things collide, our gifting and our passion. And where that collides, that's where your calling will be found. I think a lot of times we think that our calling is this really like, distant um, thing that we can't ever come upon. It's like a, a pot of gold at the end of a metaphorical rainbow. Like, how do we ever find it? It's so daunting. But I think the truth is that God wants us to answer our call. He wants us to, to live that out. And so he's not going to hide it from us. 
The more you seek him and the more you pursue him with your life, the more that calling will, will amplify in your ear and it will get louder. You don't understand what you need to do. And so um, in order to, to do that, it's good also to realize that it does take some thinking and some, some prayer and some thought. In order to figure out your calling, it does require time. It requires perspective. It requires uh, prayer. And it does require wrestling. Um, the truth is sometimes it, it's a struggle, but if, if God's invited into that struggle, it's, it's well worth it. I think there are a few questions in, uh, in Brad's book um, that he asked to kind of help us put our finger on what God's calling is, and I thought this was really helpful. Um, the first one is, is this. What would you do if, if money wasn't an option? If you could work for free and just do what you love to do, what would you do? Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Shelly, goes to the Grove here, and and she has been in this process of discovering her calling and, and, and seeing where her gifting and her passions uh, collide. And she had a couple of passions. She has a passion for education and, and education across um, the world. And she also has a passion for, for living um, more organically, more naturally. And, and so she came upon this idea of making these handcrafted soaps that, that doesn't have any toxins or anything like that. And she was able to figure out a way to combine that into um, a business that, that went towards helping others. You see, she realized she had just a gift of encouraging and, and giving. And so she created this thing called uh, Gifted Soap. And, and it's really neat. And what she, her heart behind it was to take uh, something simple like handcrafted soap and, and have it purchased so it could be given as a gift and then proceeds from that would go to give the gift of education to people around the world. Now, at first, Shelley thought, well, I can't do that. I'm not creative. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I'll fail. And she had these different things that were kind of standing in her way and, and fear that was blocking her. But through prayer and, and, and reading um, some good books and, and studying God's word, she, she went for it. She heard the calling and she accepted it. Another example is... Uh, this young adult um, college-age guy in our, in our church named Noah. Now, Noah, I met him in July. And he came in and he said, hey, Matt, I want to help with the junior high ministry. And I said, yeah, I, I want you to help. Come on in. And he, he showed up on Sunday. And then he showed up on Wednesday. And then by the second week, I realized he kept coming into the office during the week. He was there Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And he was there more than most of our paid staff. And I'm like, man, what is up with this guy? He really wants to be here. And I realized he had this calling. And so he wasn't paid to be helping junior hires, so he was just going to do it anyway. And he just kept coming and kept coming. And he basically forced my hand. I had to give him an internship because he was so um, just so diligent and he just kept coming. I love that story. He, he knew that that was what he was supposed to do. And so he went after it with everything he had. A second question we can ask ourselves when trying to discover our calling is this. What wakes you up at night? In other words, what, what just kind of bothers you? What, what kind of frustrates you with your current situation in life? Sometimes restlessness is God-given. And it's given by God to get us out of our ruts, out of our comfort zone, to go and, and to, to change something that needs to be changed. Or more importantly, to obey God. And that might mean moving and going and, and doing something that you're not currently doing. The third one is this. What's waking you up early in the morning? In other words, what can you just not wait to do in your day? You just get so excited. You get out of bed. You're just ready to go. This is probably uh, something you deeply value. It's a passion of yours, something you love to do and, and you want to work towards. That might be uh, partially where your calling lies. So our second step of discovering and living out our calling is to embrace the call. Will you embrace your call or will you run from it? And it might sound silly to say that, but I think you do have an option when you're called, whether or not you actually answer the call, if you embrace it or not. Jonah in the Bible in the Old Testament uh, was called to go preach to Nineveh. To, to tell this, this people group that they needed to repent or they'd be destroyed. And, and Jonah didn't want to go because Jonah 
didn't like Nineveh. And so he literally got on a boat going the other direction from his call. He ran from it. King Saul, Samuel got to anoint him as the first king of of Israel. But Saul, uh, he didn't embrace his calling either. When it was time for his coronation as king, they couldn't find him. He was hiding. He was literally hiding among the luggage. He, He didn't want to accept that. What caused him to run from his call? Maybe fear? Sometimes fear is, is, is crippling. In, in Shelly's story, for a while, she, she wouldn't go for her, her soap business because she was afraid. She was afraid of all these insecurities started to come up to the surface. What if I fail? What if I'm not good enough? What if there, it's not a good product? All these thoughts. And, and a lot of times that same fear is what causes us to not embrace our call. What if... God's not there. What if, what if? The what ifs start to take over. But what if God is faithful? What if God equips you? What if God orders your steps and and goes with you? And what if he provides for every need, even the ones you don't even know you have? Samuel gave us the ultimate example of the posture of how to receive your call and embrace it. His response was, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. I love this. It reminds me of Mary. And Mary, as she gets this this life-altering news that she's going to have a baby that's going to be God's son, knowing full well that society would judge her because of her situation, would would assume that she was unfaithful to Joseph or, or whatever. But she responded to Gabriel with this posture of, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Her response was, may it be exactly as you have said, I'm the Lord's servant. That's the posture we need to have. The posture of someone ready to listen, of someone ready to go, of someone ready to embrace and live out God's God's call in their life. That's the posture we need to have. So the third step is the action step. It's, It's to actually boldly live it out to take a step forward towards this call that God has placed on your life. Calling is this constant prompting, this nudging uh, towards what God's calling you to do. And you can say you embrace it, and you can say you hear it, but until you do it, uh, it's still just a good idea. And I think often talk is cheap, right? We need to put that action step um, in motion. And, and the thing that I've, I've realized along the way is, is a lot of times I'm called before I'm equipped. And that's a little bit of a scary feeling, it, is knowing I'm called but not feeling like I have what it takes to do it. But if God's the one calling you, don't you think he'll also equip you? And so I want to encourage you guys every step of this way, uh, every step of this journey uh, to check back in with God, to keep growing closer to him, letting him uh, continue to nudge you towards this thing by studying his word and, and really just knowing his heart and seeing how that, that meshes up with, with your passions and your gifting. Are you, are you going to go for it? If you're called and you don't go, God will find someone else. He doesn't need you. He wants you, for sure, to do his glory. And so for that, that calling and that... Um, that living it out, it it takes steps towards uh, being bold. If you move a little bit closer to living out your calling this year, move in the right direction. Set a goal for yourself in 2017. Over the last six six and a half years, I've I've felt God stirring up this new calling in my life. And that's an important note to make right there too, is that callings can come in different seasons of our life. Uh, The calling you get in this season of your life could be different from the calling last season. Um, Or they could just all of a sudden mix together and form something new. But the last six and a half years, I felt this call for uh, on my life that God wanted me to to basically learn how to counsel people. I had this growing passion for people who are hurting, people who are in difficult moments in life, who are are going through tough things. And, and, And so I felt I needed to go back to school and and take counseling courses. And so I've been taking master's courses in, in counseling for six and a half years. And uh, I start my final class in about three weeks. And I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you, Lord. And 
it doesn't mean that once you do your calling, like, it, it's super easy and everything works out. No, it's been a struggle. But it's amazing that since I've been pursuing this, this, uh, this, this passion of counseling, God has used it daily in my life. As a junior high pastor, I mean, spoiler alert, junior hires need counseling. And it has fit in perfectly with my job here at The Grove. I have a chance to use my counseling skills almost every day uh, with the students, with, uh, with their parents too, and with every, really, anyone that needs counseling at The Grove, they usually get sent my direction. Uh, they say, hey, I need to talk to a pastor. Um, my door is open. And I love that God has used that calling and, and that equipping has come with it, which has worked really, really well hand in hand. Uh, God has used that uh, immensely. Um, I feel to bless uh, my ministry I get to do here every day at The Grove. And so as you're thinking about what you might be called to do and you start to think about 2017 as a whole, um, I just want to encourage you to discover your calling this year. And, and that, it starts again with knowing God. And so press into God this year. Study his word. Live it out. Obey it. Follow it. Know it. Secondly, embrace your call. When you feel called, embrace it. Have that posture of speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And then take those bold steps to live it out and move in the right direction, and God will order your steps. He will equip you for the task at hand. He's good, and, and he is faithful.